Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. Here we are. Here we are. Part two of Sibling Rivalry. Now, ever since we had our first episode about sibling rivalries, I have been thinking about my own siblings. Ah. We know we were all tap dancers. <laughs> I did not know yes, that. Yes, my uncle, my uncle taught tap dance. We had recitals. We were all in tap dancing. My dad was a tap dancer when he was a young man. No way. Yes. Thankfully, none of us were good enough to compete <laughs> against each other. <laughs> no Shirley Temple in the making. No Shirley Temple. <laughs> I had no idea. I love yes, that. Yes, yes. I love to tap. I wish I could get back to it. Let's dive in right away with two guys Film noir king, as you call him, and the beefcake. And I don't think a lot of people know that they were brothers. I didn't know yeah. they were brothers. And they're both so different as far as their Hollywood careers. This is Lawrence Tierney and Scott Brady. Good old Scott Brady. But yeah, these were like Brooklyn-born guys. They were rough and tumble. They grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in Brooklyn, whereas Gene Tierney, same name, no relation, oddly enough, grew up on the very wealthy side. Ah. So interesting. Yes. There were two Brooklyns. <laughs> and another thing that we've found that's a sort of a common denominator in some of these stories is Lawrence Tierney was spotted doing a play. Yes, he was, which is interesting. He was this rough and tumble guy. He was a smart ass. He was always in trouble. Kind of found his way because he got a modeling job for Sears Roebuck, which I don't know why I think Lawrence Tierney modeling for Sears Roebuck is funny to me. It doesn't seem like his brand, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it led him to theater, which led him to an RKO talent scout, spotting him and took him to Hollywood. So he was really discovered in theater like so many others. His brother, Scott Brady, who was five years younger, he went an entirely different route. He joined the army. He served in the war. He got out of the army. He came to Hollywood too. So, you know, now both of the brothers are in Hollywood. But Tierney, he got a lucky break with RKO. They really saw something in him. And what really put him on the map was he was cast as the infamous 1930s bank robber John Dillinger in the 1945 crime drama Dillinger. Huge hit, really made him a star. He was really that gruff, intimidating type of guy that was so perfect to play Dillinger. And he kind of got typecast in that type of role, yes, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So by now, after Dillinger, he's making all kinds of movies at RKO. He's doing comedies. He's doing dramas. He's doing war pictures. He did a war picture with John Wayne. And then he plays Jesse James. He loved to play those bad boys. Yes. In a movie called Bad Man's Territory in 1946 with Randolph Scott. So he he sort of found his lane in Hollywood. Yes. He's the bad guy. He's the villain. And it worked for him. But in that lane, he also <laughs> took he took along with him some bottles. Yeah. He, <laughs> drink it and drive and don't again, do it. Again, <laughs> again with the alcohol. And his was a consistent pattern for yeah. most of his life. Yeah. It's probably one of the most tragic falls in Hollywood history was Lawrence Tierney's demons with the bottle. Started early on, right as his career was taking off, he is arrested time and time again on public drunkenness. And he would get violent. And he would. He was a very violent man. In 1946, he's involved in a bar brawl with William Kent, who was the stepson of the owner of Macombo Nightclub during a party. He also attacked an actor, Paul Delacquazy. So he was a very violent drunk. It was constantly being arrested. But interestingly enough, he was getting very light fines and very minimum, if any, jail time. So the judges were very lenient on him, and I think it had something to do with him being a movie star. I would imagine. He got the privilege. Right, right. So, you know, this is a pattern that just repeats itself throughout his career, tragically. But meanwhile, Scott Brady, he's trying to make his own career, so he gets small parts in small movies, and originally he was billed as Gerald Gilbert, and he finally chose the name Scott Brady for his stage name, partly because he didn't want to capitalize 
capitalize on Lawrence Tierney's fame, but privately, I think it was to distance himself from all the, the drama yeah. and all the, the bad infamy, pu- the, pad, <laughs> but the bad publicity. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he became Scott Brady and started working. And interestingly, he was in a boxing drama <laughs> because he had boxing skills. Yes. So he, the fact that his brother kept getting arrested for violent behavior and <laughs> boxing people, and he's kind of making his name with the skill of boxing. Yes, it's something about fighting in those brothers, I tell you. Lawrence, even though he was constantly in trouble, he was spending more time in courts and jail than he was on sound stages. You mm. know, he still carved out this great career for himself. Right. He appeared in this movie that, if you've ever seen it, it's crazy. He plays this deranged hitchhiker in a movie called The Devil Thumbs a Ride. What uh, a in title. 1947. And it, it says everything you need to know about that movie. Yeah. But that same year, he appeared in maybe one of the most classic film noirs we have, which is Born to Kill with Claire Trevor. Again, it puts him back on top. So any dip he had in his career, he would make a great movie and he'd be back on top again. It was an interesting cycle throughout his life. Yes. Again, after appearing in these great movies, the bad behavior begins again. The demons come back. He's arrested again for public drunkenness, for another brawl, for driving under the influence. I wonder what his career and his legacy could have been had he just been able to put down the bottle. Right, right. Well, and as his career plummets, his brother's career gains some traction when he signs with Universal Pictures, right? Yes, yes, because Universal, they saw potential in Scott. But what they saw in Scott, Universal was famous for creating the beefcake star, Mm. the Rock Hudsons, the Hugh O'Briens, and they saw this in Scott Brady. So for reasons I'm sure that Universal was very aware of, in any movie Scott Brady's in, chances are he was going to take his shirt off. (laughs) Whether it was warranted or not in the script. Whether it was 20 below out, he was going to take his shirt off. Exactly. You know, it's a Western. He's in a gunfight. (laughs) Right. You know, suddenly his shirt shirt gets ripped off. Well, you know, it's about time that men get objectified, right? (laughs) Exactly. And he really, but he was a decent actor. He wasn't the greatest actor, but he had great beauty. He had a great physique. He was talented enough. He made some fun movies, lots of Westerns, lots of fantasy movies, lots of hard-boiled dramas. But what really kind of put him on top and got him into the A-list of actors Mm -hmm. was George Cougar cast him in a romantic comedy called The Model and the Marriage Broker with Gene Crane and the great Thelma Ritter. Oh, I love Thelma Ritter. Oh my gosh, we could do a whole podcast on her. Yes, we could. So, Scott's doing well. Lawrence is doing not so well. You know, by now, Lawrence is appearing in kind of more B-movies. He appeared in The Bodyguard, which I think we just mentioned prior was Priscilla Lane's final movie. Priscilla Lane. I think his personal traumas were just taking up all his time. He had no time to act. (laughs) Well, and finally, he does receive a long jail sentence. I mean, relatively long, 180 days in jail. Yes. He's released and he's arrested again for assault and then admitted into the hospital for mental treatment. Yeah, which was interesting. It's about time. It makes me think about something that there was an article in the LA Times back in 1951 and the article said about tyranny, and I think this is so interesting. When he's sober, he's serious, thoughtful, ambitious. When he's drunk, he's close to crazy. And I think that summed it up. I think he really had such a disease and it was such right. a... Right. That alcohol actually changed his personality, yes. which it can do for, for yeah, many people. absolutely. So after more trouble, he still manages to get roles. Cecil B. DeMille cast him in The Greatest Show on Earth. Right. You know, with the all-star cast with Heston and Cornell Wilde and Betty Hutton and Gloria Graham and Jimmy Stewart and Dorothy L'Amour. But of course, it's the perfect part for him because he plays <laughs> the guy, the heavy, who ends up de railing the circus train. (laughs) Right, right. Isn't that perfect? (laughs) Yes, of course. What else would he play, right? Isn't that the scene that Steven Spielberg as a young boy, isn't that the scene that he continues to try and recreate as a young man, as a young filmmaker? Yes, and actually that scene is recreated in his latest movie, The Fablemans. Right. By this time, Scott has become a full-blown movie star. He is a beefcake, I mean a B star, but a star. He's appearing in some fun movies. He's in Montana Bell with Jane Russell. Who wouldn't want to be in a movie with Jane Russell? Right. And he's also, he's really great in that campy Western Johnny Guitar from 
1954 with Joan Crawford and Mercedes McCambridge. I don't know if you've mm. seen that one, but it, great movie, lots of fun. So he's having a blast by now. He did Gentlemen Marry Brunettes, again with Jane Russell and Gene Crane. So his career's doing well. And he also becomes active in television when things like in the 50s, Lux Theater, Studio 57, right. Playhouse 90. Right. He becomes part of that. And when you're a beefcake guy, you're going to be <laughs> attracting some lovely ladies, oh, shall well, we say. Scott Brady had a thing with the ladies. Yep. And the ladies love Scott Brady. I mean, he dated everybody. Anne Blythe, Peggy Castle, Adele Jurgens, Gwen Verdon, Barbara Lawrence, Anita Ekberg. He was engaged to Dorothy Malone, the great Oscar winner, who actually, when she won her Oscar for Written on the Wind in 1956, she was dating him. So he was her lucky charm. He was her lucky charm. <laughs> and then moving into the 60s, both of the brothers' careers are sort of spiraling. In fact, Tierney was arrested for trying to crash a party thrown by Elizabeth Taylor and her then-husband, <laughs> Eddie Fisher. I mean, you can't get much more Hollywood than that. I know. Another tragic tale about Tierney in the 60s was he was arrested just hours after his own mother was found dead from an apparent suicide in January of 1960. And wasn't it around the same time that Scott Brady also got into some trouble? He did. He did. He wasn't the perfect brother after all. In 1963, he got major bad publicity when he was barred by the state of New York Harness Racing Commission from participating in any sports due to his association with bookmakers. <laughs> okay. So Scott was a gambler a little bit, but compared to his brother, I mean, his scrapes with the law were nothing. <laughs> yes, yes. In the 70s, Tierney starts off really promisingly by landing some amazing films. Yes, he did. By this time, he started to get his act together mm -hmm. a little bit. And in fact, even back in the mid-60s, he got a couple of breaks from some directors that had worked with him. John Cassavetes hired him to star in A Child is Waiting, which was a critically acclaimed drama with Judy Garland and Burt Lancaster and his wife, Jenna Rowland. So he was kind of getting himself together. He got cast by Otto Preminger in the comedy Such Good Friends in 1971 with Diane and canon. So I think by now he's starting to beat the demons a little bit. Yes, um, yes. It didn't last long because in 73 he gets stabbed in a brawl outside of a New York bar <laughs> you know, by his low-rent hotel. And then two years later he's questioned and released by the police in New York for an apparent suicide leap of a 24-year-old woman from the fourth floor window of her midtown apartment. Trouble <laughs> seems to follow him or does he follow trouble? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah it's just unlucky dark cloud, I think, followed yeah. that man. Now, moving into the 70s for both of them, this was a time of a lot of interesting television. Yeah, they both brothers turned to television. Scott appeared in The High Chaparral and Mannix and Macmillan and Wife, Mission Impossible, Gunsmoke, Hawaii Five-0, Beretta. I mean, all these great shows. And wouldn't it be perfect for those two actors to be in those kinds of shows? Because they would be that classic either bad boy or the yeah. murderer or the... And by now, the, they're probably grizzled faces. Yes, and, yes. Well, interestingly enough, and, and I didn't know this until I started doing research for this piece, it's been rumored that Norman Lear originally offered Scott Brady the role of Archie Bunker huh. in All in the Family. I had no idea, but Brady turned it down for whatever reason. I, you know, I, don't I can know why. see him, though, doing it yeah. now that you say that. I he mean, could not be. to take anything away from Carol O'Connor. But he ended up he ended up on the show. He played one of uh, Archie Bunker's flunkies, but he didn't play Archie Bunker, which is, wow, missed opportunity. Yes, yes. He also, Scott Brady, I loved him because he appears in a couple of episodes of Laverne and Shirley. He was Shirley's father. Wow. Cindy Williams. <laughs> and I remember him from The China Syndrome. Yes. Such so great. a great film. Yes. So Scott did okay. You know, Scott kind of bounced back into character roles. And so did Lawrence. By now, he's doing better. The drinking's under control. John Cassavetes, once again, comes to his rescue, hmm. gives him a small part as a bartender in Gloria, that incredible incredible crime drama yes. with Jenna Rollins. Yes. And this led to another movie well, he, he's the star of called The Prowler in 1981 and it led to small parts in Arthur uh, with Dudley Moore and then another horror movie called Midnight. So he's working yeah, again. Yeah, and Pritzi's okay. Honor. With... Yeah, of course. He was Pritzi's Honor, which, you know, and you forget he was Ryan O'Neill's father in Tough Guys Can't Dance in 1987. Yeah. So fun stuff is happening for him now. Yeah, and he also gets into some of these wonderful hour-long television shows, one of my favorites, Hill Street Blues. Yes, and in fact, he played Death Sergeant Jenkins. He gets the very last line of dialogue in the entire series when he answers the front desk phone 
phone and says, Hill Street, fade to black, end of series. Oh, what a moment. Yes. So things are looking up for old Lawrence. Scott also, he worked through the 80s too, lots of TV. I think a lot of people might remember him for, he played the sheriff in the movie Gremlins. We all remember Gremlins from high oh, school. yeah. 1984. But then it was short-lived. In 1985, Brady actually died first of respiratory failure. He was only 60. It was his wife of 18 years, Mary, was by his side. So, uh, And we don't know what the relationship between Tierney and his brother Brady was at that point. We we do. They actually had had a falling out oh, they and had. Had, had not really reconciled. They fell out sometime in the late 60s, early 70s, and they really never truly came back together, Okay, which was too bad. There was still a little life left in Tierney, though. <laughs> yep. He, he keeps coming back for he more. Gets, and, and people know this story, I think. Quentin Tarantino chose Tierney to play a, a really significant role in his gritty film debut, Reservoir Dogs, mm. in 1992. But things didn't go so well. <laughs> Tierney being Tierney. Gee, wonder what happened. Yeah. Didn't always agree with Quentin Tarantino so much that they ended up in a fist fight on set. Oh, my god! <laughs> which was widely talked about. I always get in fist fights with my directors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way to make sure you're in the sequel. <laughs> right? <laughs> Old habits die hard. So Lawrence was who he was. Yeah. He died in 2002. He was broken alone, mm. you know, which is sort of fitting and very sad. He was 82 at the time and passed in his sleep. So very different endings for the brothers. Yes. And they both live on in all of these wonderful movies and television shows. Yes. Right now, it's time for this week's Hollywood Pop Quiz. Steve, take it away. All right. And again, with our sibling rivalry theme, this question is about somebody coming up, the beloved Joan Blondell. Joan Blondell appeared in the TV series Here Come the Brides in 1968 to 70. It's what introduced me to her. The question is, which two actors who went on to very successful television careers themselves ended up starting their careers playing the sons on that show? All right. I think I know one of them. I think I know both of them. And I think he's yummy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right. We'll be back after this with more on sibling rivalries. All right. Steve and Nan will be right back. But first, another stop on the Hollywood tour. Now, legendary producer Hal Roach used to employ what he called wildies to work in his writer's rooms. Wildies were either an insane person or someone who'd had too much to drink. And their only job was to shout out any crazy idea that came to mind whenever the writers had writer's block. Not a bad gig, huh? And now back to Steve and Nan from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Next in our review of sibling rivalries, these are two women who I thought were the same person. <laughs> they look so <laughs> much alike. they look so much alike. And growing up watching them on television, I just assumed. But <laughs> we're going to be talking now about Joan Blondell and Gloria Blondell. Yes, and as I mentioned in our question, you know, Joan Blondell, she caught my eye as a kid in Here Come the Brides, which was an incredible, fun show set in the Northwest about lumberjacks and bringing brides to marry off to these horny <laughs> mountain men. <laughs> I mean, think about it. That's what the show was about. Not, not very uh, PC right now, but, you know, I know. That's... But Joan played the lady who owned the saloon. She was like the Miss Kitty of the Northwest, and she was incredible. She was so funny, and she just brought such possession as to that show and I just loved her and I wanted to know everything I could about her so I took a deep dive into her old movies and my gosh she started making movies in the 20s so it, it's a fun, fun and her her brassiness and, and ability to shine in everything she does is yes. amazing and I think it's why she became such a big star is because she just had such a light and such a you said brassiness which is a perfect word I think she made people forget their troubles during the depression mm. and I think that really made her so popular. It made America embrace her so much. And, and she really became one of the most popular and highest paid actresses in Hollywood of that era. She really doesn't have, she has the doesn't suffer fools <laughs> attitude about life. And I think I really loved that as a kid watching her because, you know, so many times you didn't see that in a lot of characters. Yes, you didn't. And it's funny because a lot of people don't realize that she had a sister who was also an actress, also did quite well for herself, Gloria Blondell. Gloria didn't have the career Joan did, but she appeared in lots of movies. She appeared in lots of television shows, probably most well-known for appearing in a lots of Lucille Ball shows. Lucy and Gloria were very close friends. Lucy put Gloria Blondell in almost everything she did. Kind of getting back to J 
Joan a little bit because let's face it, Joan was a star. Joan was a superstar. She really was. She started her career off doing lots of song and dance movies with Dick Powell. Their chemistry was incredible, so much so that they, they got married. <laughs> so must have been on screen and off screen so. chemistry. <laughs> and they did a lot of musicals, right? Yeah, they did Footlight Parade in 1933, and Dames in 34, and Colleen in 36, and the, oh, and then she did the Gold Digger movies, the Gold Diggers of 1937, yes. the, you know, which were extremely popular, and, and they just had great chemistry, and it, it was a good marriage for a long time, and until it wasn't. <laughs> until it wasn't. And then, of course, as we know, the web of love, she goes on to marry Mike Todd, who then goes on to marry Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> and we could go on down that road for a while. And, and Dick Powell married June Allison, so yes. it's just all crazy connected. Right, right. I think Blondell really hit her stride in the 40s. I mean, that's when she's at the top of her game. That's when she's making movies like Topper Returns, which was the follow-up to the classic Topper, where she kind of stepped in for the Constance Bennett character, in a way, and as far as the humor and, and things like that. She was in this wonderful female-driven war picture called Cry Havoc in 1942, with an all-star female cast that included Margaret Sullivan and Anne Southern and Marcia Hunt and Ella Raines and and Faye Bainter. She was in one of my favorites, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. She's mm. Aunt Sissy, 1945. An incredible movie. And when I just saw Desk Set, that often <laughs> plays uh, during the holiday season, and she yes. plays Peg Costello, the researcher, with Catherine Hepburn <laughs> and Spencer Tracy. Yeah, she, she's just incredible. She had such comic timing. She got an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress for The Blue Veil with Jane Wyman. She lost that Oscar to Kim Hunter for Street car, which who's going to beat Kim Hunter for street right, car? I hate to say right, it. But, yes. but you know, that just shows how revered she was by everybody in Hollywood. She's incredible as Violet in Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter mm. in 57 with Tony Randall. So many memorable performances. But this whole time that Joan is making these great movies, Gloria's holding her own. You know, she's appearing in other movies and she's appearing on television mostly. I think that's where Gloria found her lane. Mm -hmm. She played this great character called Honey Bee Gillis. People won't remember this, but there was a 1950s sitcom with William Bendix and Marjorie Reynolds called The Life of Riley. And she was kind of like the, the busybody neighbor kind of character that was very popular. She's also, she's guest starring on I Love Lucy and Lucy shows. And what people may not know is that for many, many years, Gloria did the voice for Daisy Duck in all the Walt Disney movies. Oh my goodness. Um, I think she started doing that in 1945 and I think she did it for quite, quite a, a while. while. Yes. You know, she's carved her own career away from Joan. Right. And both successful. Yeah, both very successful and they had a very loving bond. They were very close as sisters, very supportive of each other. Not much drama or tragedy with, with the two Good. of them, but they were just fun, lovely women that I think made some such an indelible mark on Hollywood. They really did. And oh, I just want to say one last thing. If you haven't seen John Cassavetti's film Opening Night from 1977, Joan Blondell is so incredible. <laughs> she plays the writer. I think the character's name was Sarah Good. It is such an incredible performance. It ended up getting Blondell nominated for a Golden Globe. It's just one of those performances that everybody should see. Mm -hmm. Joan Blondell. John Blondell and Gloria. Don't forget and Gloria. Gloria. Don't forget Gloria. <laughs> now we have some twins to talk about. Oh, it's our first twins. <laughs> yes, yes. This is Anna Maria Pirangeli. Perfect. Thank you. You took Italian. I did not. And Maria Luisa Pirangeli. <laughs> right. The lovely Italian twins. <laughs> now, these were two women that I did not know a lot about until reading your blog. Oh, good. good. Yes. Well, they ended up becoming the movie star Pirangeli and Marissa Pavon. Those names might be a little more familiar uh -huh. to people. They were these lovely Italian girls born in 1932. They both got discovered in very bizarre ways. Neither one of them really sought out the limelight. They were just these beautiful women that just got discovered. Pier went to art school and she was spotted while in art school. And this director basically approached her and said, I'm making a movie. I think you'd be perfect for the lead. And haven't we all heard that story? Of course, yes. <laughs> but it ended up being legit. 
And so she made her film debut in a movie called uh, Domani et Troppo Tardi in 1950. It was the leading role. The movie was a huge hit and it made her an overnight superstar. And didn't you end up winning the Italian Oscar, what, what yeah, is she, called the Nostro di Argento? Yeah, she won. It was just the equivalent of our Oscar. So she really started off auspicious. So debut. auspiciously. Whereas with Marissa Pavan, she wasn't sure she wanted to be an actress, but they were family friends with Cubby Broccoli, who later went on to, as we all know, to produce the James, James Bond, Bond movies. franchise. He encouraged her. He said, you really should think about being an actress like your sister. So he introduced her to Hollywood producer Saul Siegel at 20th Century Fox, who was looking for a girl for a film who could sing a song in French, which Maria Pavon could. Marissa, Can't everyone. Marissa Pavon could. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she got the role. <laughs> well, she got a screen test. And this is really interesting because at her screen test, it was basically down to her and another actress. And the other actress was a young woman named Anne Bancroft. Oh, my. Well, Marissa Pavon got the role. She beat out Anne Bancroft. Okay. I wonder if her French was better than Anne's. <laughs> exactly. So meanwhile, with Pierre, people saw her Italian movie. Of course, Hollywood comes calling. She gets scouted by MGM, whipped up to Hollywood, and they had this huge publicity buildup for her debut film, which was a film called Teresa in 1951, which was a romantic drama about challenges of this American soldier played by John Erickson and his new Italian war bride. And guess who Pierre played? <laughs> yes, and that was directed by Fred Zimmerman. Yes, the great Fred Zimmerman. And it becomes another huge success, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Story. It was a box office hit, and she is now officially a star in the United She's States. A star. In, in fact, she won the Golden Globe for Most Promising New Female, female star. star. Yeah. Yes. So she's on the rise. But as far as Marissa goes, Marissa was more about the work. And I think Marissa was more about being careful about the part she chooses. Yes. Whereas I think Pierre got wrapped up in the promotional the, studio the fame of fanfare. Yes. And they just wanted to get her on magazine covers and sell movies. Whereas Marissa held out for better parts, which plays to her benefit greatly later on. Pierre and Jelly, she's now a bona fide star in Hollywood. And Vincent Minnelli's casting her in The Story of Three Loves with Kirk Douglas, who she had an affair with, by the way. But I think his womanizing ended that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, she's in Flame in the Flesh with Lana Turner. Whereas, as I said, Marissa goes a different route. She really picks character-driven roles. and she, So a more serious actress. Definitely a more serious yeah. actor. I think she really embraced the craft more. And she chose interesting, lesser-known films. Like, she's in Down Three Dark Streets, which I had mentioned earlier when we were doing our podcast on the Hollywood sign, because the ending ends up At incredible. the foot of the Hollywood sign. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's incredible in that. That movie had Broderick Crawford in it. She did a movie called Western Drumbeat you know, with Alan Ladd, not a shabby leading man at all, where she's becoming a real serious studied actress, and Pierre Angeli's just becoming a movie star. <laughs> now, Pierre Angeli also has a very famous relationship that I think is a really interesting story. Can you talk about her and how she meets a young actor named James Dean? Yes, James Dean. Yeah, Pierre is now in Hollywood. She's making a movie called The Silver Chalice with Paul Newman, the great Heard Paul of him. Newman. And <laughs> <laughs> And James Dean is a buddy of Paul Newman, so he's making a movie a few sound stages down. He comes to visit Paul on set. He meets Pierre Angeli. It is love at first sight. They just fall madly in love with each other. They're soon one of the most popular Hollywood couples. They're and they were everywhere. together for a while. They were. And I think we all know James Dean had a complicated life, yes. probably, with what he dealt with. But I think he genuinely loved her, and I think she genuinely loved him. For a while, they seemed happy. But then... I think he brought out a wilder side in her, a more adventurous side. And I think she helped tame him a little bit. Sure. They were good for each other. Yeah. So that was a good combo. Unfortunately, her mother did not approve of him. No, 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 no. And so that made it difficult. And then... Yeah, James Dean wasn't Catholic and Italian mama was having none of that. Yes, especially back in the 50s. That yeah. would have been not done. Yeah. So they split up. She marries singer Vic Damone, leaving Dean devastated. It's been rumored that at her marriage to Vic Damone, 
Ramon that James Dean parked his motorcycle across from the church and started gunning the engine during the ceremony. I think that was his last hurrah for it was his his moment of This is the church they were married in in Beverly Hills, right? And yeah, he was just yes, hanging out out, just out front. Gunning that motorcycle. I guess it was his Ben Elaine moment, except yes. Pierre ended up marrying Vic Damone and Dean went on to having his tragic end, unfortunately. Yes. Meanwhile, Marissa waited for the right part and it came along. It she sure got did. cast in such a magnificent movie and a magnificent role for her. She was cast in Tennessee Williams' The Rose Tattoo. And that was in 1955. With the great Anna Magnani uh, yes. and Burt Lancaster. That movie put her on the map. I and mean, the movie was a huge success. It was Oscar nominated left and right, including one for her as Best Supporting Actress. So now she's considered a very serious actress and, and taken very seriously. She ends up marrying a French actor by the name of Jean-Pierre Aumont. She did the great Jean-Pierre Aumont, who was the widower of Maria Montez, strangely enough, all connected. She goes on to do good movies. She's in The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit with Gregory Peck and lots of other fun movies. But I think her family became more important. And I think Marissa Pavon's career started to not peter out, but I think she made the choice to focus more on family than career. Whereas Pierre, she was kind of lost at this point. Her marriage from Damone ended badly. She moved back to Europe. She did a few movies over there. I think she kind of lost her way as well. I think and she, she got remarried a third time, right, to Trava, Travaglioli? Yeah, Travaglioli. Travaglioli. Yeah, Travaglioli. To, uh, who was Italian composer and pianist who was 15 years her senior. They had a son. She'd had a son with Damone also. So I think family's becoming important to her. But also, the bloom was off the rose a little bit with her. Their movies aren't as great. She did The Last Days of Sodom and Gomorrah in 1962. And she also did Battle of the Bulge with Henry Fonda and Robert Shaw and Robert Ryan. Whereas Marissa now, in the 60s and 70s, they're in Europe, they're raising their kids, they're happy, movies aren't so important. She starts doing television, Wonder Woman, Hawaii Five O, that usual route that right, people right. ended up doing, which was great in the day because you had opportunities for older stars like that. For poor Pierce, still searching, her marriage ends, she comes back to Hollywood, but this time she didn't have the success that she had when she was younger. And sadly, on September the 10th, 1971, she dies of a drug overdose at and her apartment. No one knows if it was purposeful or accidental. Yeah, I think we'll never know if it was just an accident or if she meant to kill herself. But a really sad ending for a very talented woman. But on an up note, Marissa Pavan is still with us. I think she's 91 years old now and still living in Europe and happy as can be. So, And it sounds like they were still supportive and in communication with each other when her sister passed. Yes, they also very close yeah. sister relationships. So. Wow. Well, this has been a fascinating road and we haven't even talked about things like, oh, Jocelyn and Marlon Brando, <laughs> Peter Graves and James Arnaz, uh, Haley and Juliet Mills. Oh, the Mills sisters. There's so many siblings There's we could so talk many about. siblings and we'll just leave it at that for now. But before we go, we have to give the answer to our Hollywood pop quiz. The question was, in Here Come the Brides, which two actors who became huge TV stars later got their start playing the sons? And the answer is... I know one. And it is... Bobby Sherman. <laughs> yes, it was Bobby <laughs> Sherman who became a huge teen idol. And then the other one was David Soul from Starsky and Hutch. So useless information for your next cocktail party. Yes, but it's all good to know those things. Well, thank you so much for listening. And we would love it if you would give us a follow on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel at from beneath the Hollywood sign. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us at info at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com. That's this week's view. From beneath the Hollywood sign. Go call your brother or sister. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive a review and tell your friends about us too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post production supervisor Lindsay Schnebley. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schnebley and Toth. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. That's a wrap. Thank you.